weeks, we have been talking about the Holy Spirit. How many of you guys just loved our series with Pastor Rob and Pastor Rhonda and Nathan? Everyone just knocked it out of the park. We explored how the Holy Spirit is like water that cleanses us and refreshes us, like oil that anoints us, like wind that breathes fresh life into us, like the dove that settles over us with peace, and like fire that burns with power inside of us. If you missed any of those weeks, make sure you go back and listen to the message. They were powerful. And I pray that during each of these weeks, you didn't just have an experience here in service, but that you slowed down during the week to spend time with the Holy Spirit and to let him continue to do that work inside of you. Our focus this whole summer is going to continue to be on the Holy Spirit, but just not the not just the experience of the Holy Spirit, but what should be the fruit of our lives? What should show from within us when we are filled with the Holy Spirit? As Pentecostals, we're great about talking about the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues. And some of you were just like, did you, what, what did she just say? <laughs> it's really wordy and it sounds super religious, but it's just the Holy Spirit flowing out of us through our mouths, which is amazing. But if it stops there and it's not actually displayed in your life, then you are missing. You are missing the function of what the Holy Spirit's job is to do within us. Us. So our theme verse for this whole summer is Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. It says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I love how it says it in the Living Bible. It says, if we are living now by the Holy Spirit's power, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And if I were Pastor Rob at this point now, I would read to you the Passion Translation, right? But since it's me, I'm going to read from the message. I love how it words this. Galatians 5.25, it says, Since this is the kind of life that you have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold to it in our heads, as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. Wow, let us work out the implications of this decision to follow Jesus in every area of our lives. What does that look like? Well, Galatians 5.25 is actually the conclusion of a passage that describes what this looks like to be living, living by the power of the Spirit. So let's back up to verse 16. It starts here. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Do you hear that? They desire different things. Things. Jump down to verse 19. It says, The acts of the flesh is explaining what it just said. The acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Let me pause there and remind you that Jesus spoke of witchcraft as being a rebellious heart or one that is constantly challenging or pushing against authority. That's what it's saying is of the flesh. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, or being divisive, always stirring things up, factions and envy, drunkenness and orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But the fruit of the Spirit, the life where every implication is worked out, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That is what it means to live by the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit. And this summer, all summer long, what we are going to do is one by one, we are going to taste the sweet fruit of each of these fruits of the Spirit through the nine lives of some lesser known Bible characters who in the summer-loving, 
all American spirit of baseball, we're going to call the nine. You guys ready for that? All right. Well, as you might know about me already from some previous stories about the Olympics and such, I am not a very athletic person at all. So I don't have any great stories to bring you today about baseball and my personal experiences. However, I heard a story that I very much could relate to. It was about a mom and a husband who had a baby and just came home. How many of you remember that moment when you came home with that baby and you thought, dear Lord, what am I doing, right? Nothing, nothing prepares you for that moment. So they're home, they're trying to get settled. Everything is happening at once. You just never really feel like you can get the flow of it for the first few days. That's encouragement to all of you expecting moms. It just takes a little while. And so they're in the rush and the chaos of that first day. And the baby starts crying and mom's in another room working on some things. And she knows that that baby's been fed. She knows that baby has slept, which means that baby is wet or dirty. Yes. So she calls to her husband, hey, babe, can you please change the baby's diaper? And he yells back, I don't know how. Men, that excuse will only work for so long. (laughs) So mom rushes in. She changes the baby's diaper. Everything's fine. Life moves on. A little later that afternoon, she's getting dinner ready. And again, she can hear the baby crying. She knows that he's fed. She knows that he's slept. And so that means that baby is dirty Again, it's kind of all you do for those first few days. And so she calls her husband, babe, I really need you to change his diaper. And he said, I don't know how. And she said, he said, I don't know how. I'm a baseball player, not a diaper changer. And she said, well, darling, let me put it in words that you'll understand. She said, you take that diaper and you lay it out like a diamond. You put the baby on pitcher's mound. You bring home plate up to the pitcher's mound. Bring first plate over to the pitcher's mound. Third base over to the pitcher's mound. Make sure they're sealed down really well. And in case of rain, the game is not called. You simply start over and try again. Our player up to bat today is a man named Boaz. His story is found in the book of Ruth and Judges, or Joshua. And what's so fun to me about the, in this context of talking about the fruit of the Spirit, is that the book of Ruth, where we're finding the story of Boaz, is actually the book in the Bible that talks the least about God. But the fruits of his love, I'm telling you, it is palatable in extravagance. You can't help but read this story and understand and see lived out the fruit of love in Boaz's life. Ruth 1 opens in a desperate time. It's only been a hundred years since the people of Israel were set free from slavery, wandered in the desert, and then finally settled into the promised land, a place of luxury where things were taken care of and God provided for them. Yet as it so often happens when we're living in easy times, the hearts of the people begin to disconnect from God as they begin to adopt the cultures of those around them. And the land falls into famine. Now, during this time, there's a small town in Israel called Bethlehem. Yes, the very town where Jesus would be born 1,200 years later. And in Bethlehem, there lived an upstanding man named Boaz. Boaz was a wealthy landowner who we know from reading about his life obeyed the Torah. He loved his neighbor as himself. When his workers were out working the fields, they didn't collect every single scrap greedily to be able to make the most money. They intentionally left behind some pieces for the poor to be able to collect and be fed. And one day when Boaz returned from town, he warmly greeted all of his farmhands with blessings. And then he noticed someone who was hiding behind the poor who were gathering. She was shrouded in the clothes of one who was mourning the death of a loved one. She cautiously was picking up pieces of grain, her substance for that day. He noticed that she wasn't from Bethlehem. It was a small town he would have known. And she certainly didn't look like a Jew. So he called to one of his men, his overseer, and he said, who does that young woman belong to? And the overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. This 
is the woman the whole town was talking about. While in Bethlehem, Boaz would have heard everyone astir because, or everyone talking, because it says that the whole town was astir because of them. And it's no wonder. Their story, Ruth's story is, um, well, let me just tell you. Ruth came from a family led by a man named Elimelech. Now, Elimelech and his wife Naomi were in Israel, their inherited promised land. And while they were there, the famine came that I spoke about a moment ago. And in efforts to, to find a better life, to try to pave a new way, they left their home in Bethlehem, and they traveled to Moab. Now, Moab was a place where the enemies of God lived, not because God hated them, but because of the life that they lived. They worshiped idol gods. They sacrificed human sacrifices to their gods. And so the Lord told the Israelites that they were not to have any kind of interaction, let alone marry the Moabites. So you can only imagine as Elimelech and his family settled there, it was not what they expected. And then tragedy fell when Elimelech died and Naomi was left a widow. That means without protection and without provision. Naomi clung for dear life to her sons, just hoping that she might be able to raise them so that they could be her providers and her protection. And in the course of the year, she was able to find some good Moabite women to be their wives. And so she married them. And then 10 years later, once again, tragedy struck Naomi and her family when both of her sons died. Now leaving her an older woman, a widow with no protection, no provision, and two other widows dependent on her and looking to her for direction. And it says in Ruth chapter 1, verse 6, that when Naomi heard that in Moab, or when she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people in Bethlehem by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back. Go back, each of you, to your mother's home, and may the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you would find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept bitterly. They wept aloud, and they said, we will go with you. We will go back to your people. But Naomi said, no, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband, even if I thought that there was still hope for me. Even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons tonight, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. And at this, they wept aloud again, and then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and said goodbye. But Ruth, Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates us. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Boaz looked across the field. So this, this woman in the morning clothes, hiding behind his harvesters, this is Ruth. And it says in Ruth 2.8 that Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another harvest field. Don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. 
He's being a protector. And wherever, whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. He's being a provider. And at this, Ruth bowed to the ground. And she asked him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you would notice me, a foreigner? A foreigner. I imagine the words struck a chord in Boaz's heart as he heard her whisper them, a foreigner. It probably reminded him of the days when he was a child and he would climb up by the fireside at night on his mother's lap or on his daddy's lap. And he would say, mom, will you tell us again the story of the spies? Like any little boy would, right? I imagine his mother kind of uh, biting her tongue a bit as she's trying to decide which details to withhold because of his young age. And she began to tell him, my son, before we lived here as a family, I was the woman in town that everybody knew. It was my job to take care of the men who visited I imagine her going on and telling him about the day when two men came to her, her house. It was just a small house on the city gate. And these men, she was used to having men come to her door, but she noticed that something was different about these men. These were men of God. And she said to them, I know the whole town is talking how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And I know what the Lord did in Shion and Og to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it in our town, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven and God on the earth below. And she so I hid these spies. I took them and I hid them in the stalks of my room. And that same day, the king sent two messengers to my door and they pounded on the door, Rahab, send out the men that you have inside. But I had them well hidden. And so I told the messengers of the king that they had already left. And I sent them, son, on a wild goose chase out in the desert. You should have seen it. And then that night when darkness fell, I lowered them out of the window of my home in the city gate. And as they were going down, holding on to that rope, they promised me that I le if I left my rope in the window, that whenever judgment came on my city of Jericho, that I would be saved. And so I left my rope there. And the days lingered on in anticipation our city was paralyzed with fear and the gates of Jericho were securely barred so that no one was going out and no one was coming in. And then it happened. The priests and the warriors of Israel came marching at our city. I sat in the window holding on to that rope and watched them just waiting for them to barge through the city gates, but they didn't come through the city gates. They wrapped around the city and then they marched right back to their camp. And then again the next day, and the next, and the next. For six days they came and they simply marched around the city and then went back. And then on the seventh day they came again. But rather than stopping after that one time around the city, they walked around again and again and again seven times. And on the seventh time they let out such a great cry and shout to their God that I could hear the harrowing sound of the city walls cracking all around me as the entire city fell to the ground, but my house stood firm. And in the end, those two spies, the young men who had done the spying, came in and they brought me out, my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belonged to me. They brought out my entire family and placed us just outside the Israelite camp. We left our people, our city, our gods that day. And son, we became part of the family of God. So when Boaz had Ruth look at him and ask, why would you consider me a foreigner? Boaz remembered growing up as a foreigner in the Israelite camp. 
Boaz knew he was the son of Jericho's prostitutes, and yet he had been brought in by love. And because of that, when he saw another foreigner, he was able to bring her in by love. He was able to give what he had lived. So in Ruth 2.11, it says that Boaz replied to Ruth, I've been told about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people that you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done and may you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And Boaz continued to show loving favor to Ruth and she continued to work in his field through the harvest season. And a while later, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Now we're going to pause there for a second and let me give you a little bit of context here to understand. It's very common even today in Eastern cultures or in ancient cultures that marriage happens within the family. And that doesn't mean necessarily your brother or sister. That means your distant relatives where you know and trust that there is a common belief, common practice, common God. It was a safety and a protection thing. And so she tells him, she tells Ruth that Boaz is a relative of yours. He is actually a safe person for you to be able to marry and again find protection and provision. It says, tonight he will be at the window, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume and get dressed in your best clothes. She's saying, honey, it's time to stop mourning. God is doing a new thing in you and we're going to get ready for it. She says, then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet. This was a cultural way of proposing marriage or making the need for marriage known, and he will tell you what to do. So Ruth did exactly what her mother-in-law told her to do, and in the middle of the night, Boaz wakes up to this proposal. Can you imagine? He wakes up to a proposal, and he says to her, the Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed me earlier. You could have run after the young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid, for I will do all that you ask. Boaz says, in essence, I will protect you. I will provide for you whatever you need. I will be used by God to be the answer to the needs in your life. And you skip forward a little bit in the story. There's a bit of drama. You should totally read all of Ruth this week. It'll take you 10 minutes. But here's what it says. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons. I pray that over my two daughters. (laughs) Has given him birth. Then Naomi took took the child in her arms. And she cared for him. And the women women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. Now watch this. He was the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David. David, the king of Israel. The man after God's own heart. And the one whose family line through whom Jesus would come. The love of God. The same love of God who brought in a prostitute. Who brought in a widow, not just brought them into his family, but made them part of the heritage and the family line of his own son. He chose them as family for his own son. This is the love of God that we speak of. In a beautiful article from Focus on the Family, it sums up Ruth so well. It says, people often describe the book of Ruth as a love story. And it certainly contains elements of two people growing in love in the way that an ancient Near Easter culture would. But as this love story unfolds, we realize that it is more about, the lo- it is about more than the love shared between two people. Ultimately, it's about God's amazing love for all humankind, specifically his desire for people to not only experience his love for themselves, 
but to reach out and to display it in such a way that makes God known to others. How rich is that? Boaz was able to give what he lived. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. When we live it, we're empowered to be able to give it. When we let the love of God live in us by the power of the Spirit, we are enabled to be able to give that same selfless love to others. In Galatians chapter 5, when it speaks of love as the fruit of the Spirit, it doesn't speak of a sexual love or a friendship love. It says agape love. That means the love of God himself, an unconditional, unmerited, undeserved love. He calls us, no, he doesn't call us to do it. He empowers us by his spirit to overflow with agape love to a world that desperately needs to experience him. We make him known through the love in our lives when we are full of this spirit. And agape love is not an emotion or a reaction in a moment. It is a response to what 1 John 4, 19 says, that we love because he first loved us. When we are filled with the Spirit, we can give his love to others. Now, I heard a story about a misfit little league team full of extremely energetic and rambunctious second graders. These kids were off the wall through the whole game. And so finally the coach comes over to one of the kids, the one who's actually being okay, and he says, Donovan, do you understand that I am the coach? And Donovan looks up with his big eyes. He says, yes, coach, I understand. You are the coach. He says, do you understand that every call I make in this game, I do for the best of the team? And he goes, yes, coach, I understand. And he said, do you understand that you are not to backtalk me? And he says, yes, coach, I understand. And he looks at Donovan and he says, then will you please go tell your mother? <laughs> He was telling Donovan because he knew that Donovan got it. And because he got it, he could go and tell his mom. And in the same way, God is calling us. He wants us to get it. He wants us to get it in here so that we can share it with others. We give what we live. I know that every one of us has people in our life that we just have a hard time loving without looking out the room or nudging anyone. Just raise your hand if there's someone that you just, it's hard to love sometimes. My father-in-law, he calls them EGR, is extra grace required. <laughs> That's like the code word at the table for they're just a little extra to love. Or maybe for you, I imagine, like me, you've lived long enough that it goes deeper than that. There's people that aren't just hard to love. There's people that have downright wounded you. And loving them feels impossible. It feels cruel to even, even think of being asked to do that. Maybe you've been hurt to the point that the effects are actually tripping you up in other relationships or causing you to build up walls that protect you from other relationships where you could potentially get hurt again. Maybe you try to justify your lack of love for this person, but now you notice that you just can't seem to break through with God. It's like there's just one wall after another. Maybe you've prayed and prayed and you've asked God to give you more love but it doesn't seem like anything has changed. I wanna play a short clip from you from when Will, Will Jones was here a couple weeks. I mean, like, it's super, super short, but he said something so profound that I thought, I just wanna hear him. I want all of us to hear him say this again, because when it comes to being filled with the Spirit and living by the power of the Spirit, we have to have this right to be able to, to truly be filled with all that he wants for us. Why don't you watch this clip? You're saying you want more of God's presence today. It's not about asking God for more. He gave you all of him. It's about you dying to more of yourself so that he may be more in you and through you. How good is that? It's not, God has already made everything available to us. There's no way to get more of his love. He has already given you all of his love. What Will was saying was there's something in us that has to die in order for us to be able to experience that sometimes. For me, I really encountered this 
a few years before I had the joy of coming to First Assembly. I was in ministry, and I got into a situation in ministry, so even in the church sometimes, people can just get stuff wrong. In ministry, I was in a situation with some leadership that just became very manipulative, incredibly hurtful, I mean, to the point that by the time I had wrestled through it, I came out formerly an incredibly secure person, questioning everything about my identity, questioning everything about my confidence, about my character. I didn't know who I was anymore, and I went into a season of deep and intensive counseling. And at the end of my counseling, I had worked through a lot of this, and I'll never forget the day that my counselor looked at me, and he said, all right, Sarah, we've worked through everything that's in the textbook. That the last step isn't something that you have to do, but you're not going to really find healing from all of this until you choose to do it. And it's something that the Bible talks about, not the textbooks. So the last step is to forgive. <sighs> there was no way. There was no way. My hurt, it was my hurt. I had earned that hurt. I went through that, right? I see some of you shaking your head. I went through that. That wasn't just something to give away or just let go. I was so broken. I didn't know how to have a conversation without bringing that into it or without that holding on with tentacles to some aspect of the relationship or the conversation. I was so defined by my brokenness and hurt and at that point, bitterness, that there was no way I was going to forgive. And so I went home. It was months that went by. There's no way I'm not forgiving. I know this last step will just, I did everything the textbook said, we're good. And I woke up one morning and so clearly the Holy Spirit said to me, today is a good day to forgive. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I was not ready. Who was I without that? So carried on with my day. The next morning, first thing when I wake up, today is a good day to forgive. I wrestled with it all day, but I just wasn't there. Third day, I wake up. Today is a good day to forgive. And I thought, all right, if we're going to do this, I'm doing it once and we're done. <laughs> I want to do it right. So I got dressed up. I went to my favorite little Italian restaurant. I asked for a seat in the corner, and I sat there and ordered my favorite meal in a Diet Coke and a wine glass because that's fancy to me. <laughs> I pulled out my Bible and my notebook, and I sat there, and I by hand wrote out every single verse where Jesus himself talked about forgiveness. And I wasn't even halfway through that list before I was so broken by the love of God for me. What had happened to me, I didn't do that. That wasn't my sin. That wasn't something I needed to be forgiven of. But as I encountered the words of Jesus, I realized there is so much, there is so much that he has forgiven me for. So who am I to hold on to that anymore? I made a decision that day to forgive. And I lived that, that, that decision many, 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 many more times. But my prayer changed that day. And I began to pray, God, would you give me a love? Would you fill me with a love that covers over a multitude of sin? That's his, that's his word. And as I prayed that prayer and began to live it out, can I tell you that bitterness began to come out and God's love filled that place. And that brokenness broke off of me and God's love was able to fill that place. Those grudges I had been holding on to, I finally could lay them down. Even if I picked them up again, I'd lay them down again. And God's love came and filled that place. And because of the Holy Spirit's power inside of me and more and more of God's love having space within me, I was able to forgive and see those relationships restored. So that now I don't see brokenness or hurt or hatred when I see those people or hear other people talk about them, I see nothing but the redeeming love of God. 
God can do that in you. You know, when we talk about love, the fruit of the Spirit, God's agape love, you can go a hundred directions because love impacts everything that we do. But I specifically felt today that God wants to heal or God wants to fill broken places and bitter places and hurting places and angry places with the power of his love. And it's not something you have to do on your own. It's not something you have to pray, God, give me more, give me more. It's just creating space. It's creating space. I specifically felt in this service that I was to ask you to consider what things you might have in your life that are feeding things other than love toward those people. I don't know about you, but for me, I had to go off social media because it was doing nothing but feeding judgment and hatred toward other people. What are you putting in? How are you allowing the Holy Spirit to work his love in you? I'm going to ask you to stand and close your eyes as you do. Because I believe that today there are some here that you've not experienced this kind of love of God before. Maybe like me, you've experienced hurt or pain from the church or from other people. Or maybe you're someone just with the past, like Rahab or Ruth. And today, God wants you to know that he loves you so much that he wants to pull you into his family too. He wants to pull you into his family, and that's why he sent Jesus to make a way for you to be part. Jesus came, and he paid the penalty for sin. He took away everything that could block us from being able to have a relationship with God. He took away your past. He took away the wrong choices. He's taken it all so that you can experience the love of God. And if you're listening right now, and you're saying, that's me, that's me, I need to know this love of God. Would you just raise your hand? We're going to pray with you together. I want you just to lift your hand so that we know that's you. We're going to pray. We want to celebrate with you and be there with you. If you're wanting to experience the love of God, you want to be pulled into his family. To just lift your hand. I see your hand. Is there anyone else? Awesome. Bless you guys. Bless you. We're going to pray together because that's what we do as family. We do things together. So I want you just to repeat after me and say, Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you love me. And I receive that love. Will you forgive me for trying to do it my own way? And help me now to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys, it's that simple. It is that simple. That pulls you in. You are part of the family of God. You now have the power inside of you to be able to live this kind of love. I'm going to ask our prayer teams to go ahead and come on up to the front. But as I was preparing for this service today, I knew, I knew that I knew that there would be people here that you need breakthrough. You need the bitterness to go You know that you want more of God's love inside of you and he's made it all available, which means there's something that has to go. There's something that has to go and whether you understand what it is or not, you know that you wanna get there. If that's you, I'm gonna say, do not delay one more second. Don't watch to see who else is moving. This morning is your breakthrough time. I want you to go ahead and come forward. These people are all here. They wanna believe with you. They wanna pray through with you. They wanna help you get to that place of healing and wholeness again. I want you to come on forward, that's awesome. That's awesome. Don't wait on anybody else, you guys. Your breakthrough is waiting for you here. I'm telling you, Jesus wants to give you freedom today. He wants to give you freedom today. If you're at a place like me where you're just not ready, you know it's true, but you're not ready to go there. 
Can I tell you that we've already been praying that the Holy Spirit would just ride you this week? That like me, you'd wake up every day and he's speaking. He's calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you. So these altars are open and I'm gonna bless you all that you can stay or you can go as you like. Jesus, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you that you make all love abound to us. God, what a privilege. What a privilege that we don't have to come and beg for more. God, you made it all available. And so I pray this week that we would go out into our community, into our families, into our workplaces, and we would show a love that never fails, a love that always hopes, a love that always trusts, a love that always perseveres, a love that overcomes every obstacle and makes a way. God, a love that isn't merited, but is given freely. Jesus, would you teach us how to love as only you can? Would you empower us by your Holy Spirit to walk with the Spirit? For any who's holding on, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would move unrelentingly in their weakness, in their life this week, drawing them to you. Jesus, we love you. Empower us as we go this week to live by your spirit, not just inside, but in everything that we do, in every implication of our life. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Church, we love you so much. God bless you this week.